प्रसार भारती अभिलेखा गार की प्रस्तुति सदा बहार सुनहरे दौर का अनमोल खजाना Hello. While wading through the history of cinema, most of us would realize that there was never really a silent cinema. Similarly, color was not altogether absent from the medium of cinema. For example, when Eisenstein was working on his battleship Potemkin, you would have wondered why Eisenstein decides to raise a white flag of surrender at the climax of the victory of the sailors of the ship. Now, Eisenstein actually wanted to raise a red flag. But if he raised a red flag in a black and white film, he would have got a black flag rising. So what Eisenstein did was to shoot a white flag and then on the positive, release positive, he physically painted every frame of the flag red. So when the film was shown on the screen, you saw a red flag rising. That was 1925. Films in that time were constantly tinted in various colors. For example, domestic scenes would be tinted sepia, angry, violent scenes would be tinted red, and soft romantic scenes in color blue. Now, after the introduction of sound, there was really a very big debate whether color was necessary at all. But there seems to have been a kind of consensus arised at that time that it would be better to film big spectaculars like Gone with the Wind in color. Dear, I wish they'd hurry. Wouldn't be in such a hurry to see them go if I were you, my dear. With them goes the last semblance of law and order. Aren't any time. Color was considered to be a medium of expression by itself, through which only lavish spectacles could be staged. A sight like Gone with the Wind, where viewers could come and witness a sort of grandeur which no ordinary world or human being could ever visualize. Color was somehow more suited for films like animation products and other fantasy kind of material. Did this mean that the real world around us was supposed to be conceived only in black and white? Well, 30 years after Eisenstein had done his experiment with the red flag rising, the world of television, color television, and the subsequent introduction of color films fought a unique battle in the market to muster audience attention. Filmmakers all over the world made films in color in order to engage their audiences. And on the other hand, there were hectic scientific advancements made by the Technical Laboratories in France and the Eastman Kodak Laboratories in USA. While Technicolor was perfecting an additive color system whereby dyes had to physically be coated onto the film, Eastman Kodak was working on a tricolor subtractive pack whereby the color dyes were already stored in the positive film material and after exposing, the unnecessary dyes were just washed away to leave behind the photographed colors. But let's ask ourselves, what is life like? What is it that constitutes to be natural? Is color really necessary? All those films that we saw in black and white, were they not really interesting? You see, all this brings us to one crucial point, and that is color is another element of reality in the same way as sound, music or lighting contributes to the development of a story in a film. And in the hands of a good artist, color can be really used to its most imaginative ends.
In this very early experiment, we can see how Eisenstein used flaming reds against the highly contrasty lighting, which created strong black shadows. The reds and blacks bring forth a vibrant energy, which gets adequately supplemented by hints of yellow, green and gold, which act as a kind of natural complementary balance. It was indeed a difficult task for the artists of the 20th century to be highly individualistic on the one hand and to address large numbers of people at the same time seemed to be bridging two irreconcilable objectives. But the artists were not going to give up. And one such modern filmmaker was Michelangelo Antonioni. An architect by profession, he began with the new realist Italians in the 50s, but soon branched out to define a new cinematic sensitivity. In this film, Red Desert, he explores the psychological realms of Juliana, a fragile, deeply disturbed woman, for whom the only escape seemed to be through a readjustment to a mind-boggling reality and through the safety valves of fantasy. Antonioni films her and her surroundings in the disturbed colors of her mind, the dull landscape the dangerous charms of the poisonous yellow smoke, the harsh lines of an inhuman industry, and the complete absence of the live human being. Abbassa un po' i bucciatori. Dice che tutti i giorni ricevono domande di assunzioni, ma nessuna per l'estero. Anche loro sono invitati matti per trovare mano d'opera specializzata da mandare nel... No, no, è per un amico. Antonioni does not ascribe any specific emotional content to the striking color scheme that he organizes in his visuals. Like a modern artist, he lets the chromatic range speak for itself. And there is no doubt that Red Desert leaves a deep and disturbing impression on any viewer. On a similar experimental vein, another filmmaker who created epic dramas on such landscapes was a Hungarian filmmaker called Miklos Jankso. His usage of colors is extremely minimal. But when they are introduced, they produce a magnetic attraction few other films can equal. In confrontation, Yangshu begins his treatment with muted colors and pastel shades, from sharp close-ups in telephoto perspectives to reveal more characters on jeeps and on land. And suddenly, this scenario gains new prominence with the introduction of a young man in red. And a new dialogue begins. Yangshu's treatment of color is closely related to a kind of musical theatrical scale, while stylized enough so as not to enter into the realms of melodrama. I 
hanem alul, már tovább kell mennünk. Madrid határán állunk a vártán, állunk tűz az ember minden pokronát. Törködünk a vártán, Madrid népe álmán, álljuk vadhalaknak minden ostromát. Undoubtedly, color has managed to enter our real lives and established definite meanings for itself. For example, in the way traffic lights function, the role of marriage rituals, and even official color codes. But can we really believe that these mundane symbols can enter into works of art and also function in a similar manner? Do we really believe that color codes can be stereotyped? Do we believe that cold colors represent indifference and enmity, while warm colors represent friendliness? Well, to answer these questions, let's look at another film by a great master called Akira Kurosawa. In this film, Derzu Uzala, you can see how Kurosawa blends the natural inherent qualities of a character called Derzu with the color scheme of the film. К тому же у него была прекрасная душа. Он позаботился о человеке, которого не знал. So Kurosawa keeps the film in harmony with his character and lets the viewer empathize with Derzu. Капитан, это самые главные люди. Это люди пропадай, все пропадай. А это другой главный люди. Вот и сказал. И огонь живой. Да, огонь все равно люди. Огонь сердит. Тайга много дней горит. Огонь сердись страшно, вода сердись страшно, ветер сердись страшно. Color has had a great impact on several fronts in our modern times. Color has got associated, for example, with statements like love is blue, anger is red, royal is purple, jealousy and yellow. Now, do these emotional qualities really have associated color values? In this example from a Fastbinder film, the predominance of yellow is indeed striking. Let's cook him. Macht er nichts draus. Sind bloß neidisch die Leute. Nix verstehen, neidisch. Neidisch ist, wenn jemand nicht sehen kann, dass ein anderer was hat. Ah, verstehen. Und die sind alle bloß neidisch. Alle. Alle. Warum weinst du? Weil, weil ich so glücklich bin auf der einen Seite. Und auf der anderen Seite halte ich das alles nicht mehr aus. Dieser Hass von den Menschen. Von allen. Allen. Manchmal wünsche ich mir, ich wäre mit dir ganz allein auf der Welt. Und keiner um uns herum. Ich tue natürlich immer so, als macht mir das alles gar nichts aus. Aber natürlich macht es mir was aus. Es macht mich kaputt. In this scene, the old woman who is in love with the Moroccan defies the jealous and racist attitude of the people around her and promising to be true to her lover in spite of all odds in spite of the presence of all the yellow around her. Platz doch nicht, ihr blöden Schweine! Das ist mein Mann! Mein Mann! In more recent times, and in popular screenings all over the world, we were privileged to witness the work of another master 
who combined all the principles of color into one great masterpiece. His name was Bernardo Bertolucci and this multi-Oscar award winning film was called The Last Emperor. Those caught talking will be severely punished. And the very element that symbolizes life in the color red takes him back into a flashback where the hue, tones and chroma are exactly the opposite of what we witnessed in the opening scene. Open the door! Open the door! Open the door! Open the door! The memories are full of warmth and compassion in spite of the contradiction that the little emperor has to be separated from his near and dear ones to live the life of a future monarch. Mama. In today's cinematic context, we have come to take color for granted. In spite of the fact that the physical status of the color on film is so highly fragile with so many variables. Color films fade very quickly. The presentation of color on the big screen depends very heavily on the quality of the projector and the reflectivity of the screen. The color quality of the film depends very heavily on the processing laboratory and its conditions. And in spite of all these handicaps, color seems to have put black and white out of the scene altogether. To such an extent that television channels telecast old black and white masterpieces in computerized colors. Now, are color films and black and white films so incompatible with each other? So mutually exclusive? Well, think about these points and we shall meet again in another edition of Frame to Frame. Till then, Goodbye.